All right, we're going to take a look at the nonlinear quadratic isoparametric element, nine nodes. There's actually an eight node version also. And note the similarity between the word quadratic and quadrilateral. These often get mixed up, but keep in mind that quadrilateral just means the four different sides that we have on this element. And quadratic refers to the type of shape that each side can make when we add additional nodes. So they actually mean quite different things, although they do sound very similar. Okay, so first, what are the limitations of the four node linear isoparametric quadrilateral element? There it is, there's our element. And we recognize that these edges must remain straight, which means that they can only vary linearly. So there we go, there's our deformed element. And so, well, one of the downfalls of this is in its basic shape, it cannot easily map to curved edges like, say, a fillet. And when it deforms, especially with something called bending or wood bending, shear locking occurs. And we're going to take a look at that in the next slide. And also, there's only a limited stress variation. So it might have a little bit of difficulty capturing stress concentrations. All right, let's take a look at shear locking. What the heck does this term mean? Okay, so. When bending occurs, when actual bending occurs, there should be no shear stress that develops. And that's if it's pure bending, if there's no transverse shear. However, shear will develop in the four node linear isoparametric element. So let's go ahead and take a look at pure bending. This is what would happen if we had an actual beam, an actual physical beam. We would notice that at every single corner here, Due to the curvature that occurs on the top and the bottom, all those corners would remain at 90 degrees. And since they remain at 90 degrees, no shear strain occurs and hence no shear stress develops. But if we take a look at our four node linear isoparametric quadrilateral element, those edges must remain straight. They must remain linear. And if that's the case, that means these internal angles will change. They will deviate from 90 degrees. And because they deviate from 90 degrees, artificial shear strain develops. And of course, due to Hooke's law, that means artificial shear stress develops. Okay, so the nonlinear quadratic elements, they actually address that issue. And they address it by adding these mid-side nodes. So there we go. We'll go ahead and add these. And on occasion, there's a center node. Since this is a lecture on the nine node version of the quadratic quadrilateral element, we will include that ninth node there in the center. The eight node version does not have that, nine node, that ninth node. And because of these mid-side nodes here, there we go, there the arrow shows up, we can have the edges curve. And because they can curve, that means that the elements can now fit more easily around curved features, such as a fillet. And it also affects, or pardon me, addresses the shear locking issue. Because now your deformed element can look something like this. Now you can have curvature at the top and the bottom. And that means that if it did undergo pure bending, that artificial shear strain and shear stress should not develop. All right, so now let's take a look at the formation of this quadratic version of the isoparametric element with nine nodes. First of all, it's similar to the linear version where we start with our shape functions. And the shape functions, just like the linear version, are one at the node that it corresponds to and zero at every other node. So here's our four node version of the element just for comparison. And we go ahead and draw this shape function. Probably looks familiar, right? Just straight lines going from node one to node four. This is for the shape function for node one here. And so there we go, that's our shape function. And if we look at the nine node version, we just go ahead and add 
some additional mid side nodes there add that center node still for node one notice now now we have a quadratic type shape going from node one through node five and then up to node two so this means that our shape functions become quadratic as well probably the actual form of it so there are three forms for the shape functions in a nine node quadratic element first we have our corner nodes that's similar to what we had on the previous slide all right same exact drawing as a matter of fact and so we go ahead and write the shape function for node one notice how we write it where we have xi and eta out there in front, just meaning that anytime xi or eta are zero, the shape function will be zero because it has to be. All right, then we go ahead and have something very similar in form to what we saw for the linear version, one minus xi, one minus eta. All right, we'll go ahead and fill out the other three shape functions for the other three corner nodes. Notice that we do occasionally have a minus sign here in front and that's just to account for, let's go ahead and say, we take a look at uh, node two here. If we have xi is equal to plus one, but eta is equal to minus one, well, we want the shape function to actually be positive when it's at node two, so we go ahead and include a minus sign there to account for that difference. All right, so we have our corner nodes. We then go ahead and take a look at the mid side nodes. And with the mid side nodes, still have this quadratic type look here and the quadratic going in the eta direction as well we'll take a look at node 5 which is the one drawn here that's the shape drawn there all right notice that we put eta right here to make sure that anytime uh, eta is zero the shape function goes to zero and then we have Anytime that xi is plus or minus one, the shape function goes to zero. And of course, when eta is equal to minus one, then the shape function will go to one because of that minus one half we have out in front. Okay. Similarly, we can have the shape function for node six, node seven, and node eight. And lastly, we have the shape function for that center node, number nine, all right, this would just look like a big hat, I guess. I'm not quite sure how to explain it, but just a big dome. And in this case, we just set our shape function such that anytime xi or eta are plus or minus one, the shape function goes to zero. And when they all equal zero, xi and eta both equal zero, then the shape function is equal to one. So those are the shape functions that we have for nine node quadratic quadrilateral element. All right, we're gonna go ahead and draw that nine node quadrilateral quadratic quadrilateral element again. And we're gonna move on to the position functions. And the position functions, that just describes well, what's the X position and the Y position anywhere throughout this element. And it's defined as the summation between each of the individual shape functions and their corresponding x location for x and similarly for y the shape function the corresponding y location for y all right now this is exactly the same as what we had for the linear element the only difference is now we have nine nodes instead of four so using that we can go ahead and develop the jacobian matrix with a very very similar equation the only difference is that we have more nodes this equation is the exact same as what we had previously the only difference is when we go ahead and take these derivatives with respect to x and with respect to, or pardon me, of the derivatives of x and y with respect to xi and eta, we just create a longer summation because there are more nodes. That's the only difference. And so here we're going to go ahead and write it out. And this is putting some dot, dot, dots there because the slides aren't quite big enough. So you can see that what we wrote here, this row and that matrix and this column would produce this term right here, okay? This row, that matrix, this column, and that matrix, that produces, this, produces that term right there. And if you go ahead and write in this 
bottom row here combined with both of these columns that would produce this component and that component of that two by two Jacobian matrix. Great. So now we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the stiffness matrix. And fortunately that equation is the same for linear and quadratic elements. And so we might remember this, we have a thickness out front, we have our double integral from minus one to one, strain displacement matrix, there's our Jacobian that we described on the previous slide. All right, constitutive matrix C, that's the same, just Hooke's law. There is our strain displacement matrix. And this actually changes size to account for those additional nodal displacements. So as the name strain displacement matrix uh, sort of gives lead to, it relates the strain to the displacements. And our strains, for any type of planar element, it is really just three strains that we're looking at, right? The X direction, Y direction, and the shear strain. Our displacements, now that increases to an 18 by one vector, so we have three by one for our strains, 18 by one for this nine node element, two displacements at each node. And that means that our strain displacement matrix becomes a three by 18 matrix. And moving on from that, we can see that the derivation of the strain displacement matrix is the same for linear and quadratic elements, very very much the same process, right? It all starts with once one, pardon me, recognizing our displacement functions, just like our position functions, right? We use the summation of the individual products between a shape function and its corresponding displacement. Here we have it in the x direction, same type of form as we would have in the y direction. There's our equation for each of our strains. <laughs> All right, come on, there we go, okay. There's our equation there, right? Just the derivatives of our displacements with respect to x and y. And this is great, except for the fact that we can't immediately take the derivative of our displacements with respect to x and y because they're in terms of our shape functions, which are in terms of our natural coordinates, xi and eta. And so, here we're taking that equation that we had on the previous slide, we're expanding it to, the, to see what's inside those matrices. So there's our strain vector, there's our displacement vector, that's our strain displacement matrix B. And as we just mentioned, the shape functions that we have here, they are not in terms of X and Y, they are in terms of our natural coordinates. But fortunately, the Jacobian matrix can help here just like it helps in that four node linear quadrilateral element. And so we can just relate terms like we have here and here to the derivatives that we can find of our shape functions with respect to the natural coordinates xi and eta just by taking the inverse of our Jacobian matrix. So that would give us our strain displacement matrix. And at that point, all we need to do is integrate our stiffness matrix. But since we have quadratic uh, shape functions, now we need more Gauss points. All right, so let's take a look at what we have here. Each of those matrices, we're looking at the strain displacement matrices and the Jacobian matrix, uh, specifically the determinant of the Jacobian matrix. So they contain the derivatives of the shape functions, which will be linear in one direction and quadratic in the other direction. And for the determinant of the Jacobian matrix, that will actually give a cubic in each direction. So we'll go ahead and use the equation. Well, pardon me. First, we'll see like what the max possible order could be. Could be a seventh order polynomial. And so, if we use the theory of Gauss quadrature, then that means that we would need at least four sampling points in each direction in order to gain a 100% accurate solution. Okay, that's nice, but commercial fine element software does not do that. <laughs> they, they typically use three points, three in each direction. So let's go ahead and ask the relevant question, why? Why are they, they using three in each direction instead of four? And we should start this answer by remembering that 
FBA is an approximation. It's not 100% accurate. It's, you know, it's not a magic uh, answer generator. It's, you know, it, it's, it's a theoretical and a, an approximation. So as it is an approximation, and usually it's actually too stiff, there we go, the, it turns out that using a three by three matrix of Gauss points still gives a reasonable approximation without the excess cost of a four by four. You know, keep in mind that with three by three, that would correspond to nine calculations per element. Four by four, that would calculate or probably correspond to 16 individual uh, calculations that would need to do. All right. And something that is pretty a little bit beyond the, uh, the scope of this particular lecture is that Morse Gauss points can improve the accuracy of individual element stiffness matrices, but it can make the overall finite element analysis accuracy worse. All right, this is a little bit strange, but keep in mind that it's usually a bit too stiff, and it turns out that the more accurate it makes this, the more stiff it makes the finite element analysis. So there's actually some things called uh, reduced integration elements, and we're not going to go too in-depth in that here, but these elements actually sort of counteract that. They, they purposely use less Gauss points to try to get overall a more accurate FBA solution. So that's, that's a bit beyond the scope of this lecture, but just wanted to mention it there. So we do choose a 3x3 three three Gauss quadrature, three sets of three Gauss integration points to integrate our stiffness matrix. So similar to what we have for the linear element, except now I and J each go to three. We have nine total Gauss points. There's all those Gauss points drawn up on our element. And here's what we'd have for each of those Gauss points. So if we went ahead and did this total summation, we would have nine different terms and each of these rows corresponds to one of these Gauss points. They're corresponding xi and eta locations within the element and the corresponding weights that would be included inside this portion here, the integrand portion of this integral that would need to be included. All right, so with that, we go right to our reflection questions. The first reflection question we have is describe when nonlinear or quadratic elements could be useful or could be more useful than linear elements. The next question is, why do quadratic elements require more Gauss integration points? Why are more Gauss integration points required to solve the stiffness matrix for quadratic elements? And this last one isn't really addressed directly, but it's sort of asked as, uh, as having further reflection for the student is what is the increased computational cost when converting a mesh from linear to quadratic and that's the last reflection question that we have and that should wrap up this discussion on nonlinear quadratic isoparametric elements focusing on the nine node element in particular